question for you. I'm going to hand these out while I ask the question. For those who are the sons of God, where does it end? When it's all said and done, and the world as we know it has come to an end, how does it end for the sons of the kingdom? Or where does it end? Is it, okay? No, it doesn't end in heaven. It ends on a new earth. When it's all said and done, and the world as we know it has come to an end, how does it end for the sons? When it's all said and done, and the kingdoms of the world becomes the kingdoms of our God, and we live on the new earth, where will the sons of God be? Yes, you are. Anybody want to admit? Amen. From Bonnie. No, no. Don't even try that. Don't try to thank Bonnie. All right. So, if I don't have enough in one section, let me know. Take them and just keep passing them around. All right. Yeah, they're yours. They're yours. This was upstairs. I have no idea what it is. It was on the office reception desk. It had your name on it. I'm, I'm like a mailman. All right. Can you, Brent, can you believe Brent did answer? sons of the kingdom. When it's all said and done in the world, we know it has come to an end. How does it end for the sons? All right, we already came. And then there's this one. Here's what I want you to know. And this is the phrase I'm going to use. Now, I know we're going to be on the earth, and that's a, that we're going to be living on the new earth. How many know you've been around me long enough? You've heard me teaching. How many know we are not going to live in heaven forever? We're just not. We're going to go to heaven when we die now until the new heaven and the new earth. And when the new earth has been created, guess where we're going to live? On the new earth. Okay, and that will be a grand, glorious time because it will be all this good earth has minus wickedness, minus evil, minus sin. It's going to be a phenomenal place to live. Phenomenal, all right? So, but I'm using this phrase that we're going to, we'll, we'll be, live on the earth. The sons will be in total power, okay? How many of the Bible tells us that we are going to one day roll and reign with Jesus? How many know we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus, okay? And, and so here's a verse I'm going to show you. It's out of Revelation. It says this. This is Jesus speaking to the churches. And he says, to him who is victorious, I will grant a place, we can get this phrase, on my throne. As I myself was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. That's a big throne, right? Now, I want you to think about this one. But here's what Jesus says. So Jesus says that for those who are victorious, how many know that's us who overcome? That's us who overcome by the land. That's the sons of the kingdom, the born again, the redeemed of the Lord. However you want to phrase it, that's who we are, the victorious. And he says to you who are victorious, I will grant a place for you to sit on my throne. Okay? Now, I want to talk about this a little bit because here's one of the things. We just came through a season, did we not? What season was it? Election season. The election season where there was all kinds of people pursuing places of power, positions of power, spending copious amounts of money. Copious amounts of money. I mean, when you spend $15.9 billion on a presidential campaign, how many know that's a lot of money? It just, it just staggers me that every American could have got a check for $50 out of that. Right? 15.9 what? Pursuing power. Political ads, TV ads, you know, you, you, you look at everything. The Senate, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Congress, the, the races for those, governor races. All of this so that there is a pursuit of power. And so tonight's lesson is the pursuit of power part one because there's a part two I'm going to do. So what I want to show us is starting with this. 
the, the, Jesus came and he with an offer. He came with a proclamation. Okay? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the promise was the kingdom. Right? And the way we go into the kingdom is through Calvary, where Jesus died. We accept his offering. That is our access point to the kingdom of God. Okay? Remember, I'm going to say it up to I, I'll say this a bunch to I die. The gospel was not only about Calvary. The gospel was about the kingdom. And Calvary was the means by which we entered the kingdom. Okay? The gospel, the good news, is always about the kingdom. Okay? Now, and so there was a, but the kingdom makes a demand. The kingdom makes a draw on our life. The draw is the kingdom, the demand, if you will, is obedience. Okay? How many know that he's looking for sons of the kingdom who will be obedient in the kingdom? Right? Obedient to the values of the kingdom. Obedient to the laws of the kingdom. Obedient to the structure of the kingdom. Okay? You see, here's what we do. If I just had a conversation with somebody this morning. And they're trying to figure out. They're walking around in a level of fear of whether or not what they believe and how they live is going to be enough for them to get to heaven. Now, and they're ordering their life because this Christian group says this, and this Christian group says this, and this Christian group says this, and this Christian group, so there's confusion in them. And I said to him, I said, let me explain something to you. I said, if you want to, like, first of all, how many know we do nothing to secure our salvation except offer what Jesus presented on Calvary? Now, there is a way in which we live once we're saved, but it's not to get salvation, it's because we're saved. I said, but here's how you need to order your life. Get in the Gospels, get in the Bible, and read about the kingdom, and order your life to the kingdom, because that's what Jesus taught. You can find church life that'll tell you a certain way to live, but it won't always be kingdom. All right? What you want to do is, how do I order my life to the kingdom? How many know that's not that hard? Some of you look at me, I don't know, Pastor. That. No, it's not that hard. Get into the parables. Get into the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. All these different things. That shows you how to order your life after the kingdom. Okay? Now, the kingdom demands obedience. But there's an offer that comes with it of power. Now, let me show this to you. All right? First of all, Paul was writing to Timothy. This is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, how many of you have died, how many of you have died with him? Okay, some of you can get saved tonight. All right? That's what that means. All right, how many know if you died with him, how many know you're going to live with him? Okay, all right, some of you can still get saved. I'll get all your hands up sooner or later. Okay, if we die with him and we also live with him, if we endure, we will also what? Reign. reign with him. If we are victorious, we will also reign with him. So there's this promise. If I die to myself and I die with him, then I'm raised to life with him, then... There's a promise one day I'm going to reign with him. Where am I going to reign? On the new earth. Okay? There's um, Revelation 5.10, one of my favorite <coughs> scriptures of all the Bible. You've made them into a kingdom and priest to, sue, to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Okay? There's a promised day where the righteous will reign. The sons of the kingdom, the sons of God will reign. Now, okay. Check it out. So, but, but Jesus says this. It's so cool how he says it. To those who are victorious, I, you will sit on the throne with me. Wow. You know what I know about most earthly kings? They don't want anybody on the throne with them. They don't want any. I want to be king and nobody else king. Listen, most despots in our world, most of the dictators in our world, how many of them are not sharing their throne with anybody? Right? Look through the Bible. Read through the Bible of the kings of the Bible. And what are you going to find? You're going to find a bunch of kings. Some of them got to be king because they killed the other king. Right? You're going to be some. It's, it's an amazing study. Right? Jesus said, so what happens? So Jesus, here's what, how to win. When, when he was victorious, the Father gave him a place on his throne. How many know had he not been victorious? Had he not lived a sinless life, not become the, the, the pure, spotless lamb of God? How many of you know he would have never been given a place on the throne of God? So God himself shared his throne with the Son. As we are victorious, Jesus makes room for us on his throne. Right? This is, 
I, it, it really struck me, the scripture, this week, all right? Now, this throne, think about this throne. This throne that belonged to God and was given to Jesus to share is now given to believers, the sons of the kingdom, and it becomes a place of shared power. Most people don't want to share power. Most people want power, control, hold on to it, especially whenever you're looking at the worldly leaders, right? So the throne is this place of shared power. Now, okay, the power existent on the throne. Now, I want to show you this. This is very important. The power that is existent on the throne is power that is free from the egotism which corrupts men in every other realm. How many of you know that the quest for power, the thirst for power, the appetite for power, the moment you get power, how many of you have ever known somebody in your life that they got to a certain place of authority or power and control and they turned into a jerk? Yeah. Not Pastor Troy. Quit looking for Pastor Troy. I knew that was coming. Like, they, they just turned into a jerk. The, 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 the Bible tells us tragedies of this. King Uzziah. King Uzziah was one of the best kings Israel ever had. He was uh, uh, economically a good king. He was a builder. They were military might. All these things. But King Uzziah, the Bible says this, that when he became successful, his heart became proud. And when his heart became proud, then he thought, well, I'm a king. I'm going to also go and do the work of the priest. All right? The moment he stepped into that trying to be the priest, God struck him. God gave him leprosy. Okay? Because there's egotism which corrupts men in every realm when they get a level of power, okay? okay? But what, the, what, what this throne shows us is that it is free from this earthly egotism. There's a shared power that the Father says to the Son, I'm going to make room for you. The Son makes room for the sons of God. I'm going to make room for you. That this power to rule and to reign is a shared place, okay? See, because here's what you got. At the, begin, at the center of this throne is a self-giving God is at the center. Okay? Who is he? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's a self-giving God. He gave a part of himself. So that what? The son would become the representation of God. Would become the incarnate, the image of God. Then you have the self-serving son who revealed him. Because how many know we couldn't see him without Jesus? The Bible says Jesus was the exact image, the exact representation. His words were God's words. His works were God's works. And so you have a self-giving God at the center, and you have a self-giving son who refilled this self-giving God. And so now, in the kingdom of God, man is the place of final power. That in the kingdom, when this world ends someday, in the kingdom, humanity will be on a shared throne, and we will be in a place of Do you know what the world rages right now to see who's going to be in power? Do you know what the battle in heaven started over? Mm. Who's going to be on the throne? Lucifer rebelled. I want the throne. I want that seat of power. I want that seat of authority. I'm going to raise myself up against you. Took a third of the angels and rebelled. Okay? And it was all over power. And we live in this world where the prince of the power of the air, Satan, corrupts governments, corrupts leaders, and there's a quest for power all over the world. Look at, look at the wars we have, right? Look at the stuff that happens. But in the kingdom, man will be in the final place of power. So, so get this. Get this image. So here's God on the throne. And when Jesus becomes victorious, God moves over. And he gave a place on the throne to Jesus, who was the God-man. Because how many know he was fully God, fully man? Yeah. Right? When we, when we follow him, he's fully God, fully man. So God makes room for Jesus. Then Jesus, who was the God-man, moved over to give a place on his throne to man. Right? Check it out. This is so cool. Because this is, this is, well, I'll tell you what it is in a moment. Okay? Because here's what it does. That shared throne, it reveals the nature of the creator. Okay? The shared throne. You say, well, how, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Okay, it shows the nature of the creator. You see, the creator 
created creatures that will share in the government of that creation. Now stop and think about this moment. That's what he did at the beginning. At the beginning of all, when he created the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the animals, and everything else, he created all of creation. He created humanity. Then he created a man, and he created a woman from that man, that they would be the image of God who would rule and reign and share in the government of that creation which he just created. We were always meant to help govern his creation. What did he say? He said, hey, roll over the fish of the sea. Roll over the birds of the air. Take dominion. Do this. Do this in my image. Do this with my blessing. Do this with my authority. I created you to share in governing my creation. But here's one rule. Right? Go back to it. But there's one thing. Eat from all these trees and live. Eat from the tree of life and live forever. Every seed bearing plant I've given you. But this one. That was mine. That was mine. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that one. Because when you eat of that one, you're going to die. Death wasn't God's idea. He never intended for us to die. So now he says, don't eat from that one. And what do we do? We eat from that one. Right? And their eyes became open. Right? And then once their eyes were open, now they saw things that they saw before, but they couldn't see those things the same way they saw them before. Because they, they saw the same thing day after day. They saw day after day they were naked, but they felt no shame. But all of a sudden, now the same thing that they've seen every day for how many years, they see differently, but now they see it differently because now they're seeing it through a filter of good and evil. And now the other stuff comes with it. And now they felt shame. How many of those shame was not part of the garden until they sinned? How many of those shame not part of our life until we sinned? Right? Because how many know sin will always change how you see something? Right? So now get this. So, but, but remember this. The original idea of the creator was to create us creatures to share in the government of that creation. Well, guess what? We're coming back to that someday. When the, when the new heavens and the new earth and we roll and reign on the earth, guess what? The created are going to help govern the created. It's going to happen again. Okay. So, the sons of the kingdom are created by God to share in the government of the sons of the kingdom. So that's coming. That's coming someday. Okay? Now, and you say, well, why are we talking about this? Well, I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay. The sons of the kingdom are to be made into the Father's perfection and perfection of love. Okay? So let me know that you and I, that we are constantly undergoing this process, this transformation, where we're being created in the image of Christ. How many know some days it's a stretch? How many know some days you look like that image? Some days you look like an ink spot on the cardboard. <laughs> right? Okay? But, now watch this. The sons are to share the creative rulership with the father and son. That's coming. But, here's the question we're going to talk about in a moment. Let me get to it. Okay, so here's what the Bible says. Those who are victorious, those who obey the laws of the kingdom belong to, remember these two phrases we used, given to us by a man named E. Stanley Jones, that we belong to an unshakable kingdom and to an unchanging person. Come on. I love those two phrases. They just, that, th this is unshakable. You can shake all the kingdoms of the world all you want. All right? We're, we're citizens of America. How many know America can be shaken? Yeah. How many know it was years ago it was shaken on 9-11? Yeah. Right? It was shaken back in Pearl Harbor days. It was, it's been shaken over and over by various and different things that have happened. Here's a kingdom in which we belong that cannot be shaken. Right? And then we have an unchanging person. What do we do? We just elected the 47th president. Right? How many know all those people were different? Right? How many know they all change? Right? Leaders change. Presidents change. Okay? But we have one who never changes. All right? How many know people that change? How many know people who change like the wind? Like, how many know some people you talk to them in the morning and they're having a great day? And by the time the day ends, it's like, who's that person? <laughs> okay? It's, it's kind of like those filters I love to teach people about. Yeah, you went to bed looking like 
No, you went to, uh, the, well, I, I could go that way. But at night, there was a picture, and it looked like a beauty queen. And the next morning, here comes Shrek. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm Shrek all the time, all right? But man, I'm, I gotta tell you. Oh, shut up, Jim. Just don't teach the lesson. I just, uh, here's what I don't, can I just tell you what I don't understand? It'd be like taking me, some of these, okay? Me, I'm gonna pick on me. Okay, and I go out and get one of those filters. <laughs> oh, baby. All right, I get some hair. Get all oh, that thick hair. And then I get my face a little bit chiseled. <laughs> Okay, and I get rid of this right here, okay? All right, just perfect. And the next morning, somebody sees me, oh, there's pumpkin head. <laughs> I've seen some people, they put this stuff up, I'm like, I thought you, your face is as round as a pumpkin. It's cute, but it's still round. <laughs> Don't do anything over, use a filter again, all right? But, but, but the point is, this we, we, we can change, can't we? Man, we have the ability to take all those filters and change ourselves and mold ourselves. And we can be, right? Our personalities can change. Our emotions can change. He's constant. We have two absolutes in our life. The kingdom and the person. The kingdom and the king. They're both absolutes. All right? Now, okay. Now, when we obey him, we become part of this and belong to him. And now we become something. Okay? In this world now, not just the future world, but in this world, okay? First of all, we become the salt of every situation we find ourselves in. Every situation. Jesus says, you're what? The salt, right? Look at it. He said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under. How many like salt? Oh, you're my people. Man, I've got some salt people here. Micah is my twin. He loves salt. Troy always like, how much salt you gonna put on that? <laughs> Listen, do we like it? <laughs> we have a we go for lunch or we have a dinner here or somewhere we go get a dinner. Micah always finds a salt shaker and he brings it to me. We both use it, right? All right. Um, but but salt is good, right? But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're the salt of the earth. Think about that. Okay, just hold on to that thought. It also says that we are the light in every situation we find ourselves. So you salt and you light. Here's what Jesus said about that. You are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp or put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Listen to me. How many know this doesn't say it gives light to only those who are Christians in the house? No, seriously. Hear what I'm saying? Hear what I'm saying? You put it on it, and it gives light to all who are in the house. To believers and unbelievers alike, you shine light. Okay? When, 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 when Israel came out of Egypt, how many know it wasn't just Israelites who came out of Egypt? There was also a mixed multitude that came out with them. Okay? How many know that when they put the blood on the doorpost, it was anybody in the house that was spared? Not just Jewish people. Right? We can go on and on, show you example after example of that. All right? He says, your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So, he says, to those who obey and become sons of the kingdom, you become the salt of the earth in every situation. You become light in every situation, and it brings glory to your Father who's in heaven. Now, here's the question. Not the question, but here. See, we become dominant. In every situation, not because we're wanting or trying to be dominant, but because situations demand the very things they stand for in a body. So in other words, what am I saying? We become the dominant in situations and circumstances because the situations demand the things that I stand for, the things that are in me, the kingdom that was with me, the kingdom that I belong to. So now, all of a sudden, here I am, I'm a person, I'm a son of the kingdom, and I've got a group of starving people, guess what I do? Thank you. You always look at me, don't, what do you do? I say, good luck, hope you go find some food. <laughs> no, we provide answers, okay? Because see, the situation demands the very things that you stand for. How I many you know that as the sons of the kingdom, we should stand for justice? We should stand for justice. 
How many know we should stand against human trafficking? How many know we have? A, we should bring salt and light into every situation because that should be the very thing that we stand for and that we embody. Okay? Think about this. Peter and John gone to a place of prayer. Here's a beggar since he was a kid begging at the gate. That's how he made his living. And all of a sudden, here comes these two men, two sons of the kingdom, filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at this man and his situation. They said, to what? I got no silver and I got no gold because how many know the kingdom of God is not about silver and gold? He said, but what I got, I give you in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. They were dominant because what was inside of them was the very thing that was needed in that situation. Um, think about this one. Philip. Philip. Okay, who was Philip? Philip was originally a guy that was waiting on tables, giving out bread to widows. Ends up in Samaria, a city in Samaria, where the Bible says he preached the good news of what? The good news of what? The kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. He did miracles, made the sick well, and there was joy in the city, the Bible says. You see, he was dominant as he preached the kingdom and did miracles and spirit. They, okay, so all of a sudden, everything that he was because of the kingdom that was in him and the kingdom that he was in, now made him salt and light in every situation. Okay? How many know you can walk into situations just by the very nature of who you are and whose you are and what you belong to and you can solve and answer every situation? Say, I never need that, Pastor. I don't care. Read the Bible. <laughs> right? See, because here's what happens. The situation presented to the sons of the kingdom makes a draw on the kingdom of the sons. It's making a draw. It's like this. Okay, when I have a situation and my computer is not acting the way that it should, I call Ghostbusters. No, I, I do something, right? What do I do? I go to Ferguson okay, and I threaten to kill him if he don't fix it within 30 seconds. And I go to him and what am I doing? I got a situation, I got a circumstance. And I got a need, and what happens is my situation makes a draw on what's inside of him in order to fix my situation. How many know that's what Jesus did? Is that not what Jesus did? The woman with an issue of blood, she comes. He doesn't even know who it is that's touching him. She touches him. He said, hey, oh, time out. Who touched me? Who touched me? And they said, you're crazy. Everybody's touching you. He said, yeah, but somebody touched me. They drew power from me. It's an amazing Every Sunday, people can gather and worship Jesus, but not everybody draws power from him. He said, ah, oh, somebody touched me different. They thronged around me. She drew, she made a withdrawal on me for her given situation. Over and over and over again. The woman comes and wants him to heal her daughter. Ah, oh, go away, go away. We don't, we don't give the bread to the dogs. Yeah, but even the dogs eat a crumb from the table. Yeah. God, you got great faith, woman. Right? Think about this. You see, when the situation, it's making a draw on the kingdom of the sons. When you are used by God in a supernatural gift, a gift of the Spirit, how many know that's a draw from the kingdom? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's never about you. Matter of fact, God uses us sometimes in spite of us. Okay? Now watch this. So, so here's the deal. So the sons of the kingdom will one day share the throne of power. But what we need to see is what is the spirit of the sons in power? Okay? Again, I mean, there's lots of people who want power because they're narcissists and they want power. There's lots of people in the world who want power, but they want it for selfish measures. There's lots of people who want authority. Right? I'm going to show you what the nature, the quality, the characteristics of what the sons should look like. Because let me tell you something. I meet lots of church people. Man, go figure. I meet lots of Pentecostal church people. Guess what they always want? Power. I want power. Power. Okay, we want power too. But there are some things that we need to understand 
in order how we operate in that power. Jesus says this, Matthew 20. He says, you know that in the world, rulers lord it over their subjects, and their great men make them feel the weight of authority. But it shall not be so with you. Among you, whoever wants to be great, everybody say great. great. Anybody here want to be great? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got three of you. The rest of you just want to be mediocre. Happy <laughs> mediocre day. We need to have a happy mediocre day. Okay, for all those who want to be mediocre, that's your day. Okay? Who doesn't want to be great? Do you want to be? And, and I'm not talking. Let me think. I'm not talking about greatness in the eyes of the world. How, how many of you want to be a great son of the kingdom, daughter of the kingdom? How many of you want to be a great mother? A great father, yeah. uh, a great what, a worker, a boss. What, how many of you want to be great? Okay, yeah. okay. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Uh, I'd like. I would rather have said among you, whoever wants to be great must have servants. <laughs> All right. And whoever would be first must be the willing slave of all. Huh? No, I want to be first. I want to have slaves. Like the Son of Man. Oh, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for many. This is a snapshot of what kingdom leadership looks like. This is a snapshot of what kingdom power looks like, what kingdom authority looks like. This is a snapshot, okay? So first of all, the sons of the kingdom who are one day going to share or inherit the throne of power, they have to be separate-minded rulers. The best leadership in the world is servant leadership, bar none. There is no better model. There is no better thing out there. Servant leaders who operate in humility and look to serve and, and, and are not egotistical, mania, maniacal, narcissistic, insecure, selfish individuals. And that's just the pastors. <laughs> you laugh, I've met many of them. All right? But this is, we, we got to be servant minded. Back to that scripture. He said, what? he said, he didn't come to be served. Hmm. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. <laughs> Everybody saying, uh -huh. <laughs> right. do you remember kind of what was going on? They were duking it out. What were they duking it out on? Who was going to be the greatest when Jesus was gone? <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, and remember about half before that? The mother of the James and John. Hey, God, I got a wait. I got a favor to ask. What's your favor? When your kingdom, I want my son Johnny on this side, and, and I want my son Jimmy on this side of you, in your kingdom. And the other ten became indignant. Yeah, because let me know when mommy's coming to put you in charge of them. You ain't gonna like it, right? And they become indignant. So Jesus comes with this. Now. God's, but, but I want you to see something. God has an expectation. His expectation is that the sons will rule and reign. That's his expectation. He, he's not going to hold that from the sons. He wants this. He expects us to rule and to reign. He expects us to use that authority. He expects it of us. I go so far as not only does he expect it of us, he created us for that very thing. When he created us. Okay? So understand, there's an expectation. Listen to me. We need to know the expectation. Why? Because you don't know the expectation. You never live up to the expectation. There's an expectation. If you don't give your kids an expectation of what they should live by, they'll live by their own code. Give them a code to live by. Give them something to excel, excel to, 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 to ascend to. All right? Ohio State. Brother, we still love you. I got the right color. Penn State is still little brother. <laughs> All right. Jesus, okay, so what did Jesus do? Jesus then showed them a picture. But he was showing them a picture by contrast, right? He said, so he used the rulers of the world to contrast how the sons of the kingdom should rule. He said to them, he said, the rulers of the world, they seek to be great. The rulers of the world, he goes back to this verse, they want to lord over you. They want to hold sway over you. They want, to, they want you to serve their interests. That's what the word actually means. That they would hold sway over you, that you would then serve their interests. And how many know that's not what servant leadership does? Servant leadership serves the interests of those who they lead. Okay? So he uses a picture, a picture that they can understand, 
of the contrast. How many of we can look at the world today and get a contrast from the world of how kingdom people should be? Right? Okay, stick with me. Okay. Because here's what Jesus expected them, <laughs> us to rule in the name of the spirit, in the nature, I should say nature, in the nature of the spirit of the order called the kingdom of God. We don't rule, we do not use power and authority the way that the world does. We use it according to the kingdom of God. Because here's the deal. The path to greatness and power for the sons of the kingdom is the reversal of the spirit of earthly rulers. They look to the Lord over you. They seek the Lord over you. They seek to hold sway over you. They, they seek to get, you know, to, to get you to serve their interest. Right? But he says, no, the, the pathway to greatness is to reverse that. It's the reversal. It's the opposite. I mean, almost everything about the kingdom of God is an opposite of the kingdoms of the world. When, okay, what's the law of the, what's the, law of the street? You hit me, I what? That's right. You, you pull a knife, I pull a gun. Okay? Okay? It's the law of the street, right? You insult me, I insult you. But the law of the kingdom is, you insult me, I pray for you. The law of the kingdom is, you hit me, I turn the other cheek. It's the exact opposite of the world. We know better how to live in the world than the kingdom of God. Let's face it. We operate by the kingdom of the world which we've been born into versus the new kingdom that we've been born into. Okay? What's going on over here? <laughs> yeah, spiritual. Okay? The way of the world is those with the greatest number of servants was the greatest. All right? That's the way of the world. I got this. I got I got this many followers. Okay? I mean, I, I heard guys one time, ar I'm not arguing, but they were comparing how many followers they had on Facebook. Oh. <laughs> oh, God help me. I'm going to get shot up, Jim. How many, number, how, many, how many following can I amass? In the kingdom, those who are the greatest serve the greatest number. It's not who has the greatest number following them. They serve the greatest number. How many can I serve? Who can I serve? How can I serve? Right? In the kingdom, if you wanted to be first, that first said you're supposed to be the slave of all. I don't... I, listen... I don't want to be the slave of one. And I've been doing that for almost 40 years. <laughs> I'll deny ever so. Carrie, back that up and start over. <laughs> See, in the kingdom, you want to be first. How many like to be first? You want to be first. You become the slave of everybody. Ooh. Paul, there are some people I don't want to be a slave of. Think about it. There are some people I don't feel. Let me put this in. They should be my slave. I mean, Jesus was perfect. And he became a slave to all those who are unworthy. It's not becoming a slave to those we deem worthy. It's not becoming a slave to those we deem fit. It's not, the, no, no, to all. Man, that puts a challenge into it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. it, it here's, what, here's, what that, here's what that scripture put it. If you want to be great, be the servant of all. You want to be first, be the slave of all. If you want to be the highest, you got to surrender. Amen. This is all countercultural to the world. Right? Now, you say, but Pastor, how does this apply to my life? It applies to every part of your life. You'll be, you'll be a better wife. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better friend. You'll be a better worker. You'll be a better kid. <laughs> Son or daughter. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> right? you, you, it, it actually it, it makes you a better, you know, 
thinking, elder, where do I, I can go on and on. It'll make you a better coach if you coach a team. I, I listened to Nick Saban the other day, and I wish I could get a, could have got this down. But maybe I did. Hold on, time out. transactional leader versus a transformative leader and how then it became about about who he was leading not about him and it, it, that was such a good clip I saw this like yesterday and um, so if you get a chance look that up and and uh, I'm just glad Nick didn't swear okay <laughs> but it's a great clip on talking about that that how he became a better coach and he became a successful coach when it stopped being about him and then it became about the team and that what benefited them as people. All right, all right, we go, we go. Okay, for the sons of the kingdom, the way up is the way down. The way up is down. If you wanna go up in the kingdom, you go down. Okay, if you wanna go up, you serve. You wanna go up, you bow. You wanna go up, that's what you do, okay? The methodology of greatness in the kingdom, here's what happens. Because now, just as Nick said in that thing, makes it beneficial to all concerned. Listen to me, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, keep making this more personal. When you become a servant leader in your home, when you become a slave to all in your home, when you do those things and you lead with that spirit, all of a sudden, you become great. And that greatness is to the benefit of all concerned. Alabama become great when Nick had a change of how he coached. When he went, became transformative rather than transactional. Okay? And now, I promise you that when you lead your family in the spirit of Jesus and this greatness comes, it will, make, it will benefit everybody around you. Don't we want that? All right? There's many of families that have a dad or a father that doesn't want to be a servant leader. Wants to be an ogre. Wants to be a tyrant. Wants to be a dictator. Trust me, we still lead. It's not that we lead them. We're, being a servant leader does not mean you are a weak leader. Being a servant leader is not being a powerless leader. Being a servant leader is knowing to use my power in a way that benefits you. Being a servant leader means when I use my authority, is my authority is used to make you better. It might even mean I bring discipline into your life, but I bring it to you in the spirit of serving you so you become better and you benefit from it. Amen? Amen. In the kingdom, those that serve go up through service. Those that go up are those who go down in service. I'm going to get down and serve, right? You can't get away from this in Scripture. Where, where was David when they called him to be king? Feeding the sheep in the pasture, taking care of the sheep in the pasture, right? See, the fleshly appetite for greatness, it corrupts the person. And it corrupts the people whom we use to achieve greatness. 
Because you know what happens? If I, use, if I have a quest and a thirst and a fleshly appetite to be great, to be known, to have power, and I use you to get it, it corrupts me, but it corrupts you because then you resent me for the way in which I've done it. You resent my leadership because I'm using you. You resent my leadership because I'm using you to get something to fulfill my carnal nature, my fleshly appetite. Right? Uh, and that, so, it, so it corrupts both the leader and the people. But here's what happens. The so sons of the kingdom, we assume greatness. Okay? Well, I should have had some comments or something. The sons of the kingdom assume greatness. Their own self-interest is linked. So our self-interest is linked with the desire to serve others so everyone is benefited and fulfilled. Okay? There's a desire. The sons of the kingdom have a desire, okay? We want to be great, but we link it with the desire to serve others so that everybody is benefited, not just me. So everybody, it's like that old phrase, so all boats rise together. To the way of the world is, if I rise and you don't, I don't care. If, if I'm benefited and you don't, don't care. If I win and you lose, don't care. But the way the kingdom is, Everybody benefits. Okay? All right, I'm almost done. Notice that Jesus didn't say wanting to be great was wrong. He didn't say ambition was wrong. He just instructed how to frame it and how to pursue it. I, I don't... You want to be great? You want to, it's okay. It's okay to say I want to be great. It's okay to say I want to be a great father, a great mother. It's okay to say I want to be a great worker. I want to be a great boss. It's okay to say I want to be a great pastor. I'll keep trying. Okay? It's okay to say I want to be a great... It's okay. What do you want to do? What's the alternative? Suck? <laughs> yeah, I got an ambition. I'm like, what's your ambition? I want to suck as a parent. <laughs> what's, what's your ambition? Well, you know, I got this job. I'm a pastor. I hope I suck. <laughs> I mean, think about it. What's the option? My mother back to me. Please don't use that word. <laughs> I'll be getting a text pretty soon. Stop <laughs> using that word. Stink. <laughs> Stink, stank, stunk. <laughs> I love that song. All right. He never said it was wrong. Framing it. We've got to frame it and how we pursue it. Okay? If you want to be great, be the servant of all. If you want to be first, be the slave of all. If you want to be like the Son of Man, Jesus. Give your life as a ransom for all. And those are challenging things, right? And it's, it flies in the face of worldly leadership and worldly stuff. It just does. It flies in the face of earthly greatness and pursuit of it. But we're not pursuing earthly power, are we? But see, these are the qualities and the characteristics of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom. And so this is only part one. And um, because, because, no, because we will rule and reign on the earth one day. But how many know we're actually ruling and reigning now as well? And there's a pathway to greatness. And the pathway to greatness is servanthood. It is giving ourselves. It's becoming a slave to others. It's about serving. It's about causing others to be benefited. That's what kingdom power looks like, kingdom rule. We often think about the power gifts, and yes, those are part of it. But there is a power of just how we live and just how we serve. There's an inherent power in how we serve people. There's an inherent power that brings a revelation of Jesus and the Father and how we are a slave to others and how we serve. And humble ourselves. So that's part one. Any questions? Any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. No, Do you, can you hear her? No. no. It's amazing. Never thought we'd have that day. In your little um, video, which we couldn't see the video, we only heard it. He used he used a word. He said emulate. He changed so that so that those under him 
there would be others around him who could emulate him. Emulate means match or surpass. So when we're in kingdom leadership, it is so that others around us can match where we are and surpass it. And that's opposite any type of leadership that you see in the world. Nobody wants, you can match me. You know, you can be, you can have the same title that I have, but don't take it higher than me. Mm -hmm. But he is saying to emulate, to, to match and surpass. We want to teach those around us, our goal needs to be, I want you to be better than I am. We want that for our kids. Mm -hmm. And then when they do it, we kind of get all, you know, <laughs> bent out of joint. But, um, but we want those, if we're mentoring, if we are teaching, if we are leading, our goal needs to be, I want to bring you here to this level, but I want you to take that higher. Mm -hmm. I want you to go further than I ever thought I could go. Mm -hmm. So you take this and run with it. It, it yeah. was interesting. All right, can, but, and think about it. Jesus said what? Jesus took these 12 men. He said, follow me, learn from me, become like me. And then he said, oh, by the way, greater things than these shall you do. Uh, so, okay, so it's that time. Same spirit. Others? No? All right. Father, thank you. Thank you for um, calling us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that we become sons of the kingdom. And thank you that you created the created to help govern the creation. But Lord, let us learn how to use that power in the spirit for which you intend us to use it. In Jesus' name, amen.